Hi, this is Jaya. In this video, we shall see the summary of Epithalamion by Edmund Spencer. Spencer was born in London somewhere between 1552 or maybe 1553 and he attended the Merchant Taylor School and there he studied Latin and Greek. Later, he studied literature and religion at Cambridge University, Pembroke Hall, and he received his BA in 1573 and MA in 1576. He published his first volume of poetry, The Shepherdess Calendar, in 1579 and dedicated it to Sydney. And then he wrote The Fairy Queen and Amorati and Epithalamine, which is a sonnet sequence dedicated to his wife, Elizabeth Boyle. Spencer served as a secretary first to the Bishop of Rochester and then for the Earl of Leicester and it was Earl of Leicester who introduced Spencer to the other poets and artists in Queen Elizabeth's court. In 1580, he was appointed secretary to the Lord Deputy of Ireland and later in 1596, he wrote an inflammatory pamphlet called A View of the Present State of Ireland. And in 1598, during the Nine Years' War, he was driven from his home in Ireland and he came to London where he died in 1599 and was buried in Poets Corner in Westminster Abbey. And uh, Spencer wrote Amroti, that is Cupid's uh, in Italian. And uh, he wrote this to woo his wife Elizabeth Boyle, whom he met in Ireland. And though he had written Amroti earlier, it was only published after his Epithalamin, which is his wedding song. And Epithalamin was written in 1594 to celebrate his marriage to his wife Elizabeth Boyle and was later published in 1595. And the wedding day is described in accurate detail down to the position of the sun, moon and stars on that particular day in June in 1594. And some critics also feel that Epithalamin is Spencer's expectation of his wife or about the proper relationship between the governing England and the subject Ireland. So this can be taken as a political poem or is love poem but generally it is accepted that he wrote it for Elizabeth Boyle and it has a total number of 24 stanzas with 365 lines. We should remember that in a year there are 60, 365 days and the daytime is mentioned in the first 16 stanzas and the night in the last 8 stanzas. And uh, the ode he begins with an invocation to all the muses to help him to awaken his brighton. And once a sign has risen, the bride awakens and begins a procession to the bridal bower and then she comes to the temple and there she gets wet and the celebration ensues. As soon as the wedding gets over, the groom wants everyone to leave and the day to shorten so that he may enjoy the bliss of his wedding night. And once the night arrives, the groom prays to various gods that his new wife's womb might be fertile and give him multiple children. So now we'll go to each and every stanza and see what he says. In stanza 1, the groom, that is Spencer, calls upon the muses to inspire him to properly sing the praises of his beloved wife. Generally, when they are writing, they'll only call a single muse, but here Spencer calls all the muses because he feels that the subject of this poem requires so much of mythic inspiration. And he claims that he will sing to himself as Orpheus did for his own wife. And uh, here the reference of Orpheus is from the allusion that the hero was luring for his bright spirit from the realm of death. That is Orpheus wife was dead and then he used his beautiful music to inspire the god of death and bring back the spirit of his wife. And he wants to uh, the same way wake up his wife from her sleep and lead her to the wedding day. And uh, if you notice means all the 24 stanzas will end with the woods shall to me answer and my echo ring. Now let's see what he says in the first stanza. He says, you learned sisters, you learned sisters are the muses. He says, you learned sisters which have oftentimes been to me aiding. So whenever I write poems, you will come and help me to write those poems, others to adorn and also to decorate my poems with beautiful words, uh, whom you thought worthy of your graceful rhymes. Uh, and why you all did this is you thought that my poems were really worthy of your grace. So you blessed me with your 
help and to adorn with beautiful words that even the greatest did not greatly scorn the and that is why when i wrote poems about the great people they did not scorn they did not hate me to hear their names sung in your simple lines and that is why they were very happy in fact to hear their names been sung by me but joyed in their praise and they praised me they were so happy to praise when i wrote songs about them and when you list your own mishaps to mourn and at the same time when i had to make write a poem about some mishap and to mourn like which death or love or fortunes wrecked it raise i had to write about death or about a failure in love or about a loss of fortune at that time i have to write a very sad song your string could soon to sadder tenor turn you help me to make use of words which turn the situation even more sadder and teach the woods and waters to lament that when anyone heard this song they also lamented and not only human beings even the forest and the water bodies lamented my poems were to that extent your doleful derriment because of your help now lay those sorrowful complaints aside and says okay okay i don't want to think about anything which is sorrowful now and having all your heads with garland crowned now he says all of you i want with your heads crowned with garland help me my own love praises to resound because now i'm going to write a poem about my own love now let the psalm of any be envied and the song which i'm writing should make everyone to envy it should be to that extent so orpheus did for his own bride now what orpheus did for his bride like uh, his wife was dead and so he used his music to amuse the god of death and bring back her spirit so i unto myself alone will sing in the same way i am also going to sing a song the wood shall to me answer and my echo ring up now why he wants to sing that song is he wants to wake up his wife from sleep like i how orpheus made his wife to get up from death and then in stanza 2 he says that the before the break of the day he tells the muses to go to his beloved's bower and wake her up because hymen who is the god of marriage is already awake and he himself is also arisen up and he says that the muses must remind his bride that this is her wedding day it is an occasion that will give her lot of great delight for all the pains and sorrows which were in the past so we can understand they did have certain uh, uh, sorrow in the past and he hopes that hereafter they will be very happy in their married life he writes early before the world's light giving lamp world's light is sunlight so he says before the sun could rise his golden beam upon the hills doth spread before the sunlight can spread on the hills having dispersed the night's uncheerful damp and uh, we know that very well uh, when morning sun rises the uh, night darkness will disappear do you awake and with fresh lusty head go to the bower of my beloved love so he says you go and wake up my beloved from her bed my truest turtle dove dove is a symbol of love and he says she is my true symbol of love bid her awake for hymen is awake tell her to get up because the god of marriage hyben is already awake and long six ready forth his mask to move and is ready to uh, move away with his bright tread that flames with many a flake and is very is ready to do his task why means and many a bachelor to wait on him because on this particular day it's a special day many bachelors are waiting for him he is a god of marriage he has to come and bless them to get married in their fresh garment stream all the bachelors are ready to get married in their fresh garments bid her awake therefore and soon her diet ask her to get up and get ready for lo the wish day is come at last because the day which we have been waiting for all these days has come at last that shall for all the pains and sorrows past pay to her usury of long, long delight and he says now all the pains and sorrows which we had in the past will all be paid for in this happiness and while she doth her diet do you to her of joy and solace sing 
that all the woods may answer and your echo ring and while she is getting ready you sing to her he says and in stanza 3 he instructs the muses to summon all the nymphs that they can bring along with them to the bridal chamber and he also tells that while they are coming they should gather all the fragrant flowers and decorate the path leading from the bridal bower uh from the, the bridal bower to the marriage ceremony uh, where it is going to place and this flowers must be from the bride's chamber to the wedding chamber so that when the bride is walking she'll be only stamping the flowers and not the stones on the way and uh, he says that uh, they song should also awaken the bride he writes like this bring with you all the nymphs that you can hear both of the rivers and the forest green and of the sea that neighbors to her near so he says when you are coming bring all the nymphs from the rivers from the forest and from the sea and from all the places which are nearby all with gay garlands goodly well be seen and all should come with colorful garlands which can be seen beautifully and let them also with them bring in hand another gay garland for my fair love of lilies and roses not only that they should also bring another garland which is made out of lilies and of roses bound true love wis with the blue silken ribbon and that garland must be bound with the blue silk ribbon and let them make great store of bridal posies and let them ek bring store of other flowers and at the same time they should bring also many other flowers to deck the bridal bowers because i need all that flowers to deck up the place where we are getting married and let the ground where as a foot shall tread for fear the stones a tender foot should wrong be strewn with fragrant flowers all along and diapered like the discolored mud and the remaining flowers must be put on the floors and it should look like a meadow so that wherever my bride is stamping she must be only putting her foot on flowers and not on the stones which may hurt her and he says which done do at a chamber door away and this must done from her chamber door itself for she will wake and straight the whiles do you sing uh, this song unto her sing the wood shall to you answer and your echo ring up because as soon as she gets up she'll start walking to the wedding chamber so from her place itself from her chamber itself i want the flowers to be on the floor like a meadow covering the land up and in stanza of four he addresses the various nymphs which are coming from the natural locals like forest rivers and all that and he tells them to make the wedding day perfect and he says that the nymphs who are taking care of the ponds and lakes should make sure that the water is clear and uh, there should not be any fishes or any blemishes there and it should be in so clear that they can see their own reflections in it uh, then he addresses the nymphs of the mountains and woods who are taking care and keeping the deers all safe from the ravening wolves uh, he says that they should also come here and they should see to it that nothing happens to the bride in this wedding day like how they are taking care of the dear in the forest they should take care of this bride and both of them must be also they and help out to decorate the wedding site and they should make the place beautiful he says you nymphs of mulla which with careful heed the silver scaly trots do tend full well and greedy pikes which use therein to feed those trouts and pikes all others do excel so he says uh, those who are taking care of the water bodies keep the water clean and uh, those who are taking care of the doe do means deer with their spikes uh, and chasing away the wolves which are trying to feed on them and you likewise which keep the rushy lake where none do fishes take bind up the locks the which hangs scattered light uh, he says all of you you just tie your locks tight and in this waters which you mirror make and make all the water body so clean that they should be like mirror behold your faces as the crystal bright that is when you look into the water your face must be looking like a crystal that when you come whereas my love doth lie no blemish she may spy because the water must be clear like crystal and when you look in that also your face also must be clear as a crystal so that there is no blemish on you and when you come and meet my bride she must not be able to find any blemish you must be so very clean 
and ek you light fit mates which keep the deer that on the hoary mountains used to tower and the wild wolves which seek them to devour and then he addresses the muses in the mountain he says that you are the people who are taking care of all the deer and protecting them from the wild wolves which come to eat them with your steel darts do chase from coming near you will be there protecting the deers and chasing away the wolves with your steel darts up be also present here i want you also to come here to help to deck her and to help to sing that all the woods may answer and your echo ring i want you also to come here protect her and help her to dress up and also sing to her in stanza 5 he now urges his bride to get up because the sun has long risen and gone and phoebus who is the sun god is showing his glorious head the birds are singing and the groom says that their song is a call of joy which is directed at the bride and then he addresses his bride directly and demonstrates uh, uh, both his impatience and the ineffectiveness of relying on the muses and nymphs to summon forth the bride so he says it's a waste waiting for the nymphs to come and wake up his wife so he wants to wake up his bride himself up wake up now my love awake for it is time the rosy morn long since left it in his bed so he says get up the sun has already got up from his bed all ready to her silver coach to climb up now the sun god has gone to her silver coach to climb and phoebus begins to show his glorious head hark how the cheerful birds do chant they lays and here to the birds singing cheerfully and carols of love sprays they are all singing about love the merry lark here matins sings a loved now he talks about the different birds which are singing the thrush replies the mavis descent plays the owl shrills the radock warbles soft so goodly all agree with sweet consent to this day's merriment and he says that the singing of all the birds is as though they are agreeing that this day is a day for joy ah my dear love why do you sleep thus long so he says why are you sleeping so long when meter way there that you should now awake because i feel that this is a time where you have to get up and get ready to away the coming of a joyous make and hearken the and hearken to the birds love learn song the dewy leaves among i want you to get up early and also listen to the birds song which are coming from this dew leaves for they of joy and pleasance to you sing that all the woods may answer and your echo ring so he tells her get up get up and get ready and also enjoy the song of the birds because the birds are singing that this day is a day for joy for merriment and in stanza 6 we find that the bride is now awakened and eyes are shining like the sun and he says uh, that uh, all the daughters of the delight to come and take care of his bride and he also summons the hours of the day and night the seasons and the three handmaids of venus to come and attend to his bride and he also urges uh, all of them to do to his bride what they do for venus and sing to her and to help her to dress up for her wedding he says my love is now awake out of her dreams now she has got up from her sleep and her fair eyes like stars that dimmed were with dark some cloud now shew their goodly beams and he says that her fair eyes which were dimmed with darkness in her sleep are now shining with sunshine more bright than hesperus is head doth rare and he says the way she is shining is more brighter than the sunshine come now you damsels daughters of delight now he calls all the daughters of delight help quickly her to dight come and help her to get ready but first come you fair ass which way be got in joe's sweet paradise of day and night and he also calls the fair ass because that full day is going to be a day of joy and he also calls day and night which do the seasons of the year a lot and he says you are the ones who are doing the seasons throughout the year so you should come here and all that ever in this world is fair do make and still repair and he calls everything which is in this world which is fair he says all of you come and make this day the best and repair whatever is wrong here give remove whatever is wrong here whatever is unwanted here and you three handmaids of the cyperian queen and which do still adorn her beauty sprite help to adorn my beautifulest bride so he calls the three handmaids of the cyperian queen to come and 
help his bride to dress up and he says that you have to dress up her, dress her up in such a way that she will look as the beautifulest bride there must be no one who is equal to her beauty in this world like that you have to dress her up and as you array still throw between some graces to be seen and as you used to venus to her sing the wiles the wood shall answer and your echo ring and he says like how you dress up venus in the same way you have to dress her up and just like how you sing to venus you also have to sing to her and in stanza 7 the bride is now ready with her attendants who are also virgins that is the uh, bride's attendants are all young women who are not married and now it is a time for the groomsmen and the groom himself to prepare and the groom says that the sun uh, to uh, shine brightly but not so brightly and uh, if the sun shines very brightly it may burn his bride's fair skin and then he prays to pebus who is both the sun god and the originator of the arts to give this one day of the year to him while the god can keep all the remaining days to himself and he says for giving him this one day he will exchange with him his own poetry and as offering to the great favor now we can find that spencer is referring to his poetry as so very worthy as offering to the god in exchange for one day from our year and he believes that he has earned uh, this favor and uh, he, this day belongs to him rather than the sun god now he says now is my love all ready forth to come so he says now my bride is ready to come let all the virgins therefore well await so let the all the virgins come and wait for her and you fresh boys that tend upon her groom groom is himself now he calls upon the boys who are going to come along with him prepare yourselves for he is coming straight be ready because i am going to come straight to you set all your things in seemly good array fit for so joyful day now he says you people also get up ready be ready in good array means well dressed because this is a very joyful day the joyfulest day that ever sun did see that is this must be the most joyful day from the day the sun appeared that is from the day human beings were born so this must be the best day fair sun show forth thy favorable ray now he addresses the sun and says shine brightly and let that lightful heat not ferment be for fear of burning a sunshiny face but don't shine so brightly that you will burn my bride's shiny face her beauty to disgrace because if you are going to burn her face her beauty will become a disgrace o fairest pebus father of the muse if ever i did honor the aright or sing the thing that made thy mind delight then he addresses pebus and he says you had listened to all my songs and i know that you would have been happy hearing to them do not thy servant simply boon refuse now i am going to ask you for a boon here he says thy servants means all the poets because all the poets believe that with the help of the muse only they can complete their poem so he says now i'm going to ask for a boon and please don't refuse it but let this day let this one day be mine and he says let this one day be for me not for you let all the rest be thine and the remaining uh, days in the year all the days will be yours that is remaining days throughout the years all the years uh, then i thy sovereign praise loud will sing if you give this day to me then i will sing about you that all the wood shall answer and they echo ring see he feels that the god itself will be very happy if spencer is going to sing about him and he says if you are going to give this one day for me i will sing a song for you in exchange and in stanza 8 he says that all the wedding guest and entertainment have started and the minstrels are playing the music and they are singing and all the women are playing the timbrels and dancing and end boys are running in the streets crying the wedding song hi man ayo hi man i am man and uh, everyone those who are hearing they are applauding the boys and they are also joining in the song and the boys are singing hi man ayo hi man uh, in such a way and uh, he says that this tradition of singing the song can be traced back to greece uh, Uh, with its delivery by Gaius Valer Catullus who sang it in the 1st century BC so he says hark how the minstrels gin to shrill aloud 
they marry music that resounds from far he says from here itself i can hear hear the music being strung by the minstrels the pipe the tabor and the trembling crowd that will agree without in breath a jar but most of all the damsels do delight so he says everyone agrees that the song is so nice and now all the damsels girls are happy when they they trembles smite and there unto do dance and carol sweet and here in the music they are started dancing that all the scenes they do ravish quiet the while the boys run up and down the street crying aloud with strong confused noise as if it were one voice and the boys are all running in the street and shouting aloud and all are singing in one voice hymen uh, hymen hymen they do shout that even to the heavens is shouting shrill and they shouting so loudly the wedding song that the song can be heard in the heaven doth reach and all the firmament doth fill to which the people standing all about as in an approvance do they to applaud and loud advance her loud and ever more they hymen hymen sing and all the people who are standing here the boys singing and they clap for them and they approve the song and they also join in the song and they are also singing the song now that all the woods them answer and they echo ring up and in stanza 9 the groom beholds his uh, bride approaching and now he compares her to peep this is another name for artemis the goddess of the moon because she is dressed in white uh, and he says that she seems to be the best virgin here and he finds that this white dress is so appropriate that she is looking like an angel and not as a woman and she is so modest because she is avoiding the gaze of the admirers around her and she is blushing as she hears the song uh, which is uh, praising her he says lo where she comes along with partly pace partly pace means she is walking gracefully and she is coming like pope from her chamber of the east she is the way she is walking it's like looking at pope walking in a eastern chamber arising forth to run her mighty race i know she is coming because she is also eager to get wed to me clad all in white she is dressed in fully in white that seems a virgin best and that shows the white color is the sign of purity and she is also a virgin a pure virgin so this white dress suits her best so well it her beseems that you would be in some angel she has been and if anyone looks at her she is dressed in white they will think that she is an angel her long loose yellow locks like golden wire and her yellow locks that has a hair a blonde hair looks like golden wire sprinkled with pearl and pearling flowers at twina and they are decorated with pearls and flowers do like a golden mantle or attire and her dress is like a golden mantle and being crowned with a garland green and she is uh, wearing a crown uh, a garland which is green in color seem like some maiden queen and when i look at her she is looking like a maiden queen her modest eyes abashed to behold so many cases as on her do stare and all the people around are staring at her and so she is feeling shy and out of modesty she upon the lowly ground a fixed are so eyes are fixed only on the ground out of being modest because all are staring at her she is so very beautiful now dare lift up her countenance too bold but blush to hear her praises sung so loud she does not have the courage to lift her head because she is blushing uh, since all around are praising and singing songs for her so far from being proud nonetheless do you still loud her praises saying that all the woods may answer and your echo ring but anyway he says continue singing their song and in stanza 10 the groom asks the women to see his bride and tell whether they have seen anyone so beautiful in this town before and then he says that all her virtues are making her more beautiful and he describes her from her eyes and her whole body and the bride's overly beauty causes all the maidens to forget their song and they are also that is not only the men but even the women are staring at her because she is so very beautiful and uh, here uh, spencer uh, describes her physical features and uh, he uses metaphorical terms like he says eyes and uh, forehead are like sapphires and ivory her cheeks and lips are compared with apples and cherries and her breast is compared to a bowl of cream and her nipples to the buds of lilies her neck to an ivory tower and he says a whole body is like a beautiful palace he says 
टेल मी यू मच एंड डॉटर्स डिट यू सी सो फेयर अ क्रीचर इन योर टाउन बिफोर सो ही कॉल्स टू ऑल द गर्ल्स एंड ही सेज हैव यू एवर सीन सो एनी वन सो ब्यूटिफुल हियर बिफोर सो स्वीट सो लवली एंड सो माइल्ड एज शी शी इज सो स्वीट सो लवली एंड ऑल्सो शी इज सो वेरी माइल्ड शी इज नॉट वेरी प्राउड अडोन्ड विथ ब्यूटी इज ग्रेस एंड वर्च्यू स्टोर शी इज नॉट ओनली ब्यूटिफुल बट शी इज ऑल्सो हैविंग ऑल द वर्च्यूज हर गुडली आईज लाइक सफाई अर शाइनिंग ब्राइट अ फो हेड आई वेरी वाइट हर चीक्स लाइक एप्पल्स विच द सन हैथ रेडेड हर लिप्स लाइक चेरीज चार्मिंग मेन टू बाइट हर ब्रेस लाइक टू अ बोल ऑफ क्रीम अनक्रडेड हर पैप्स लाइक लिलीज बडेड हर स्नो ये नेक लाइक टू अ मार्बल टावर एंड ऑल हर बॉडी लाइक अ पैलेस फेयर असेंडिंग अप विथ मेनी अ स्टेटली स्टेर टू हॉनर सीट एंड स्टैसटाइ स्वीट बोवर Why stand you still, you virgins, in amaze upon her so to gaze? Now he is saying he is describing her parts, and then he says, "Why all the virgins are standing here, and you are gazing at her? Why lest you forget your former lay to sing? You have even forgotten to sing the song which you were singing before, to which the woods did answer, and your echo ring." And in stanza eleven. Uh, the spencer he leaves the external beauty of his wife and he goes and talks about her internal beauty which he says can he can see better than anyone else because he knows her very well and he praises her for her lively spirit her sweet love her chastity her faith her honor and her modesty and he insists that all the observers also must see her inner beauty and not just uh, look only at outer appearance and he says when they see her inner beauty they will be more abstract than her beautiful appearance he says but if you saw that which no eyes can see now he says see inner beauty cannot be seen with your physical eyes so if you are able to see that the inward beauty of a lively sprite garnished with heavenly gifts of high degree because the inner beauty is garnished with decorated with heavenly gifts much more than would you wonder at that sight you will be more surprised you will be more impressed with her inner beauty and stand astonished like to those with which red medusa's maceful head when you see her inner beauty you will be more astonished they dwell sweet love and constant chastity unspotted faith and comely womanhood regard of honor and mild modesty because she is filled with sweet love constant chastity she is so very faithful and whatever a woman must have she has all those qualities and in spite of that she is very very modest they virtue reigns as queen in royal throne and now he compares her with the queen who is in the royal throne and he says all these virtue raises my wife to the queen in the royal throne and giveth laws alone to which the base affections do obey and giveth laws alone is now he is praising queen elizabeth for being lawful and rightful and he says that Elizabeth Boyle's inner beauty will also raise her to the level to that but here he uses this opportunity to praise queen elizabeth also to the which the base affections do obey and yield their service unto her will and because of this only he says that every one will do service to her with whole hearted willingness now thought of thing uncomely ever may they to approach to tend her mind to hell so no thoughts can come to tempt her and send her in the evil way had you once seen these her celestial treasures and unrevealed pleasures if you had seen her inner beauty then would you wonder and appraise us saying that all the wood should answer and you echo ring so when you see her inner beauty you will start praising her more than now and in stanza 12 he tells that they should open the doors of the temple so that the bride can enter and come to the altar and he also offers his bride as an example for the maids who are there following her to approach her. uh his this holy place with reverence and humility like how this bride is approaching her. open the temple gates unto my love he says open the temple gates for my love open them wide that she may enter in and all the post adorn as doth behave and all the pillars deck with garlands trim and let uh, every way be decorated for to receive this saint with honor due even the pillars must be decorated because this bride is entering like a saint she is so very pure and she is so very great that cometh into you 
and uh, only when you open the door wide and when you decorate all this place the saint will come and enter with trembling steps and humble reference uh, she says that the bride is coming and she is going to enter uh, because uh, that is the wedding day naturally he says uh, she will have her steps all trembling and she will be very humble she cometh in before the almighty's view and now she has come and everyone who is there are looking at her of her you virgins learn obedience and he looks at the other girls who are not married he says all you virgins learn from her how to be obedient when so you come into these holy places to humble your proud faces because when you look at her and when you learn all this later on when you come for the same occasion for your wedding you will know how to behave bring her up to the high altar that she may the sacred ceremonies they take their partake and bring her now to the altar to take part in the ceremonies which is going to take now to the which do endless matrimony make and let the roaring organs loudly play the praises of the lord in lively notes the whiles with hollow throats the choristers the joyous anthem sing so now he says let them all play the music lovely and let the chorus also sing the anthem song the joyous anthem song that all the woods may pray answer and they echo ring up and in stanza 13 now the bride comes and stands before the altar and the priest offers his blessing upon her and for her wedding and she blushes and uh, this uh, what happens is makes even the angels to forget their duties and come around her while the groom wonders why she should blush to give her uh, give her hands uh, to him in marriage behold while she before the altar stands hearing the holy praised that to her speaks and blesseth her with his two happy hands now he says look at her when she is standing in the altar the holy priest is blessing her how the red roses flush up in her cheeks and the cheeks are becoming red like rose and a pure snow with goodly vermil stain like crimson dead in grain and she is uh, her, her natural color is so very pure like snow but now since she is blushing it is becoming crimson in color that even the angels which continually about the sacred altar do remain forget the service and about her fly and she is blushing to that extent that even the angels who are inside the altar and doing their duties they have forgotten the service and they are coming and flying around her often peeping in her face that seems more fair the more they on it stare but her sad eyes still fasten on the ground and they come and they keep peeping at her face and as they are staring at her he says that her sad eyes are fastened to the ground he feels that the way she is looking only at the ground for him it appears as though she is sad are governed with goodly modesty but he says naturally it is a modesty which is making her to look at the ground that suffers not one look to glance away she does not even trying to look up and have a glance up which may let in a little thought unsound and he says maybe because of that because he wants to look directly into her eyes he says when she is continuously looking down at the ground it may uh, give me a little thought in my mind why blush you love to give to me your hand the pledge of all our band that thought is why are you blushing so much to give your hand in marriage to me sing you sweet angels hallelujah sing so now he tells the angels to sing the hallelujah song that all the woods may answer and your echo ring and in stanza 14 he says now the christian ceremony is over and uh, he wants to take his bride home and uh, start the celebration and he calls for the feasts and the drinking and he turns his attention now to the almighty god of the church uh, to the god butchers hymen and the graces he says now all is done bring home the bride again now he says the wedding ceremony is over bring home the triumph of our victory bring home with you the glory of a gain with joyous bring her and with jollity never had man more joyful day than this so he says no man would have been so very happy like i am on this day whom heaven would heap with bless because i feel that heaven has blessed me make feast therefore now all this live long day this day for ever to me holy is and he says let us have the feast and this is a long day and this is a holy day for me pour out the wine without restraint or stay pour not by cups but by the bellyful and he says pour the wine for celebration don't pour the wine in the cup 
pour it in such a way that everyone's stomach is full pour out to all that will and sprinkle all the posts and walls with wine that they may sweat and drunken be with all pour it in such a way that the walls also will be filled with wine and all of them must get drunk crown you god butches with a coronal and hymen also crowned with riches of wine he says even let the gods get drunk and let the graces dance unto the rest for they can do it best and he says let all the graces come and dance because they can dance so very well the whiles the maidens do they carol sing and let all the maidens come and sing to which the wood shall answer and they echo ring and in stanza 15 the groom says that this is a holy day and he calls everyone to celebrate uh, by ringing the bells and he tells the sun is so bright and the day is so beautiful and then he says uh, why did he fix his wedding on this day which is a summer solstice that is june 20 is the longest day of the year and the night time will be very short and uh, because of the long day he says that is nuptial bliss is delayed because only after the day is gets over the night will come and this night also will be a very brief night it will be the short night because on that particular day of the year the night is short and the day is long ring you the bells you young men of the town and leave your wanted labors for this day he says let all the young men in the town ring the bells and leave all the work for this day this day is holy do you write it down that you forever it remember me and he says all of you write on that this is a holy day so that you will remember it this day the sun is in his chiefest height with barnabai the bright from winds declining daily by decrees he somewhat looseth of his heat and light when once the crab behind his back he sees he says this is the day when the sun is at the height but for this time it ill adorned was to choose the longest day in all the year and shortest night when longest fitter were and he says i don't know why i have chosen the longest day and the shortest night for my wedding day yet never day so long but late would pass but anyway he says i hope it will pass ring you the bells to make it weary way and he says ring the bells and ask the day to go away and bonfires make all day and i want all the bonfires we we'll usually make bonfires only in the night and dance about them and about them sing that all the woods may answer and your echo ring he says i want the night to come fast so that all of us can make bonfires and dance around and in stanza 16 he continues his complaint that the day is too long and he hopes that the evening will come because he is eager to be uh, alone with his uh, bride and then he invokes the evening star to lead the bride and groom to their bed chamber ha when will this long weary day have end he says i am so tired and it's a long day when will the day end and lend me leave to come unto my love so, uh, so that when the day goes i can go to my bride my love how slowly do the hours they number spend and he says how slowly the hours are going how slowly does sad time his feathers move haste thee o fairest planet to thy home within the western form he says go go sun and settle down in your western place thy tired steeds long since have need of rest because you also must be tired because this is a very long day long thought it be at last i see it gloom and he says my god for a long time i'm waiting for the day to end and now i can see it gloom and the bright evening star with golden crest appear out of the east now i can see the evening stars all appearing in the east fair child of beauty glorious lamp of love he says the stars are the fair child of beauty and they are the glorious lamp of love that all the host of heaven in ranks dust lead and goodiest lovers through their nights dread how cheerfully they look from above and he says when i see the stars i can understand that they are all cheerful and seemeth to laugh at when they twinkling light and when the stars are twinkling it is as though they are uh, laughing at him as joy in the sight because they are also happy to see what is happening of these glad many which for song for joy do sing that all the woods them answer and they echo ring and he says that even the stars have joined in my happiness and in stanza 17 he asks all the singers and the dancers to leave the wedding so that uh, the bride can go to her bed and uh, he says that he is also eager to be alone with his bride 
and he compares the sight of a lying in the bed to that of maya the mountain goddess with whom zeus uh, came and conceived hermes and according to the legend uh, and tradition a child uh, conceived on this particular summer solitaire will uh, grow up to prosperity and wisdom and maybe that was the reason why spencer chose this day as his wedding uh, day he says now see is you damsels your delights for past so now he says uh, all the girls i think you have danced for a long time you have been very happy enough is it that all the day was yours so full day you were there with my bride now day is done and night is nighing fast now bring the bride into the bridal bows now the day is gone and the night has come so bring my bride to the bridal bowers and now now night is come now soon her disarray and in her bed her lay lay her in lilies and in violets so he says decorate the bed with lilies and violets so that she can lie on them and silken curtains over her display and display over her with silken curtains and adorned sheets and arrays coverlets behold how goodly my fair love does lie in proud humility and i want to see how my fair bride is lying with her proud humility in the bed like unto maya when as jove her took in tempe lying on the flowery grass twist sleep and wake after she weary was with bathing in the acidlian brook he says just like maya was lying down in the bed i want my bride also to lie down in a bed which is decorated with uh, flowers now it is night your damsels may be gone and leave my love alone so he says now it is night so all you girls go away and leave my love alone and leave likewise your former late to sing the woods no more shall answer nor your echo ring and he says all of you can keep singing and you can leave the place and in stanza 18 he says night has come at last and he asks the night to cover them and protect them and now he makes another comparison where zeus is affair with alcamen and is affair with night herself that is zeus had a affair with two of them and almen was the daughter of pedes and through zeus uh, uh, she became the mother of hercules and uh, this only shows that spencer is expecting a potential child uh, which will be formed because of the union on this night uh, now he says now welcome night thou night so long expected uh, that long days labor does not does at last defray the long day has gone and now you have come and you are the one whom i am expecting and all my cares which cruelest love collected has summed in one and cancel for a spread thy broad wing over my love and me that no man may see may us see that is you come and cover us so that no one will be able to see us and in thy sable mantle us and wrap come and use your mantle and enwrap us there from fear of peril and foul horror free keep us away from danger and from any foul horror which can happen let no false treason seek us to entrap i don't want any uh, one to come and disturb us nor any dread disquiet once annoy the safety of our joy i don't want anyone to come and spoil the safety of our joy but let the night be calm and quiet some without tempestuous storms or sad affray like as when jove with fair alcamen lay when he begot the great terror then the groom he says come and keep everything which will disturb us away i don't want any storm i don't want anything sad to happen and i want to have a calm and quiet some night or like as when he thyself did lie and he says like how uh, your husband lay with you and begot majesty and let the maids and young men cease to sing now let the woods them answer not the echo ring like how i want all the maids and young men to stop singing and go away and make the night peaceful and in stanza 19 he prays that no evil spirits or bad thoughts should reach them on that night and uh, he also talks about the possible dangers which can happen to him and he pleads that all they should not approach them and leave them alone let no lamenting cries nor doleful tears be heard all night within nor yet without now let false whispers breeding hidden fears break gentle sleep with misconceived doubt let no delaying dreams nor dreadful sights make sudden sad affrights no let house flies nor lightnings helpless harms now let the poke nor other evil sprites 
no let mischievous witches with their charms no let hop goblins names who sense we see not frayers with things that be not so he talks about all the possible things which can spoil that day and say that they all should not come and disturb us this night let not the shreyat owl nor the stork be heard nor the night raven that still deadly ills nor damned ghost caught up with mighty spells nor greasy vultures make us once afraid now let the unpleasant choir of frogs still croaking make us to wish they are choking he says we don't want to hear any noise of any birds of the night or even the frog because even that may think that they are choking and may make us sad around us i should not hear any sound let none of these they decrying as in saying now let the wood sem answer nor they echo ring and in stanza 20 he wants silence to be there and he wants sleep to come in the proper time and till then he wants the 100 little winged loves to fly about the bed and he wants tiny cupids to enjoy to allow them to enjoy themselves as much as possible till the day break comes up he says but let still night through night watches keep that sacred peace may in assurance reign and timely sleep when it is time to sleep may pour his limbs forth on your pleasant plain so he says let all of let us enjoy the night till we sleep when the time comes to sleep the wilds and hundred little winged loves like divers feathered doves shall fly and flutter round about your bed and in the secret dark that none reproves they pretty stills shall work and snare shall spread to flitch away sweet snatches of delight conceal through covert night you sonnets of venus play your sports at will for greedy pleasure careless of your toys think more upon her paradise of joys then what you do i'll be it good or ill all night therefore attend your merry play for it will soon be day now none doth hinder you that say or sing nor will the woods now answer nor your echo ring so he says we want to enjoy this night and we don't want anyone to disturb us and we should sleep only when sleep comes to us naturally and he wants to enjoy the whole night because he knows very well it is a very short night and the day will come soon and in stanza 21 uh, the groom notices cynthia that is the moon peeping through his window and he prays uh, the to the moon to make his favorable wedding night a happy one and he specially asks her that she makes his uh, bride's uh, womb a chaste womb a fertile womb this night and he asks her to remember her own love of the latmian shepherd and uh, endymion that is a union that eventually produced 50 daughters that is the face of the moon and he also calls on a successful conception which uh, will come out of his comfort and he places uh, all his emotional emphasis upon the fruit of the union uh, because he says now uh, instead of uh, thinking about the joy he will have he is thinking about his uh, uh, children he wants to have his progeny and as uh, he has been an impatient lover earlier but now he talks as a would be father looking for a future generation a completion of his future generation and he says who is the same which at my window peeps he saying who is that who is peeping in my window or who is that fair face that shines so bright or he says okay instead of asking like this can i ask you whose face is that so very fair that is shining so brightly is it not sindhya he says is it the moon she that never sleeps because you never sleep in the night but walks about high heaven all the night because you are walking in the heaven all over the night o fairest goddess do thou not envy my love with me to spy he says don't come and spy on us and envy me with my love for thou likewise didst love because you also were in love at one time though now unthought and for a fleece of wool which privately the latmian shepherd once unto thee brought his pleasures with thee wrought and he thinks says think about the latmian shepherd who made you happy and therefore to us be favorable now so think about the love which you had and you should be favorable to us now and sit of women labors thou hast charge a generation goodly dust and large incline thy will effect our wishful work like how you have a large generation 
bless us also to have many children and the chaste womb inform with timely seed that may our comfort breed and let our generation also have the next generation till which we cease our hope will have to sing nor let the woods as answer nor our echo ring and he says till then i will also not stop because my next thought is to be a good father and in stanza 22 The groom adds more gods to his list of patron. He asks Juno, wife of Zeus and goddess of marriage, to make the union strong and sacred. And also he turns our attention to, towards making it fruitful. He says that today my wife's womb should be blessed with a child. And he asks Hebe and Hymen to do the same for them. And thou great Juno, which with awful might the loss of wedlock still doth patronize, and the religion of the faith, uh, faith first plight, which sacred rites hath taught to solemnize, and ache for comfort often called art, of women in this smart eternally bind thou this lovely band, and all thy blessings unto us impart, and thou glad genius, on whose gentle hand the bridal bower and genial bed remain, without blemish or stain and the sweet pleasures of their loves delight with secret idle doubt succor and supply till they bring forth the fruitful progeny he says we will not leave till we conceive a child send us the timely fruit of this same night and thou for hebe and thou hymen free grant that it may be so it may so be till which we cease your further praise to sing nor any wood shall answer nor your echo ring so he asks all the gods to bless them with a good generation and then he utters a prayers to gods in the heavens that they should bless this marriage and he asks them to give him a large posterity so that they may raise up generations and uh, uh, all this must be with the blessing of the heaven and he says that i will also follow by praising the gods and he now encourages bride to rest in hope of they becoming parents a u high heavens the temple of the gods in which a thousand torches flaming bright do, do burn that to us wretched earthly clouds in dreadful darkness let desired light and all your prayers which in the same day same remain more than we men can feign pour out your blessing on us plenteously and happy influence upon us reign that we may raise a large posterity which from the earth which they may long possess with lasting happiness up to your haughty palaces may mount and for the guard of the glorious merit may heavenly tabernacles they inherit of blessed saints for to increase the count so he says bless us with many children so let us rest sweet love in hope of this and see still then our timely joys to sing the woods no more as answer nor a echo ring so he now he turns to his bride and says now come and rest and let's hope for a good generation to follow and in the last stanza he addresses a song with a good ornament uh, he says that my song will be the best ornament to decorate you and he feels that she deserves uh, uh, this song with all the physical adornments which she is already having and he says that the time was too short to proceed more further and he says song made in lieu of many ornaments this song is also made as one of the ornaments for you with which my love should duly have been decked and you are my wife and i feel that you must be decorated with my song which cutting off through hasty accidents you would not stay your due time to expect he says there are many incidents which are cutting my song more short but promised both to recompense be unto her goodly ornament but he says i promise you that this song will be a very good ornament for you and for a short time an endless monument and he says this will be an endless monument to you and in the same way spencer's song is still now read by all and is appreciated by everyone so what spencer expected out of the song he has really achieved in this it's a very long song but a beautiful uh, song by spencer if you have anything more to add on to what i've said please write it in the comment box like the video share it with your friends and if you are not subscribe my channel please subscribe thank you